as Māori rather than relying on the government to to for your rangatiratanga. You need to have a rangatiratanga mindset. As a uh, researcher, right, you think, man, this, we're lucky. Oh, at the end of the two days, oh, it's actually fai mana, fai rawa, fai oranga, mm-hmm. wina. If that's not right, we're never going to be right. All the diaries, all the accounts say our people dominated commercial fishing. Steeped in your reo, steeped in your, um, you know, Māori culture, you can do anything in this world. So, um, yeah, I guess we'll just start with, and we've already started, which I've loved the, I've loved the context and the sort of the whakamara matanga, but I guess for the people that watch just, you know, who are you called Aikwe? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And, then, and then we'll get into um, Tangaro Araro and, you know, everything that you've sort of gone through. Ka pai. Oi, um, well, ko best tūpara kātane a hau, uh, nō te tai rāwhiti, uh, ko te aitanga a hauiti, te aitanga a māhaki, uh, ngā te onuni mai tā manuhi, um, aku iwi. Um, born and raised in Gisborne, um, left when I was probably, well, after high school, as you do, sort of wanting to get out of the little towns. Um, went to university in, in Waikato um, and then did my postgrad uh, in Wellington at Victoria University in environmental policy and resource management. Um, that was all very interesting again. I suppose that was my time when I participated in research, sort of when you have to do your master's thesis and stuff like that. So that was really my taster of research. And it's probably, that was the last time I was really involved with research as such. Um, and then moved into the policy space. So as you do in Wellington, work for different government agencies. Um, so work for government for probably over 10 years, over about a decade with different um, different agencies and stuff. Um, and within the sort of freshwater resource management space, climate change, oceans. Um, and then moved into working with uh, Te Oku Kaimwana as a pan iwi entity, focusing on aquaculture in particular. Um, and then from there, sort of that whole journey of wanting to work for, for iwi specifically. So worked with um, Te Runonga Ongai Tahu, and so worked in their strategy and influence team, mostly focused on fisheries and, and aquaculture. So one of the things I suppose, coming back to my growing up in in Gisborne, um, at Te Pohor Awari Marae, um, we had the ocean around us and it's always sort of been a place where, um, and it's interesting reflecting on sort of my journey and, and sort of why you end up in the spaces that you do. Um, and so oceans has always been there. My master's thesis was on um, our area <coughs> in, at within Ngāti Onune in terms of our hapū and our um, Western science and mātauranga, so that's what my my thesis was on. Um, but always at that time too, you're sort of young and not really sure where you're wanting to go and you just go, oh yeah, I'll do that, that mm-hmm. sounds good. So um, yeah, it's interesting sort of doing the full loop, I suppose, and coming back into research again um, and leading out on this Tangaro Araro project. Um, I think when I think about things as well in terms of that, um, when you're growing up and at the marae, um, brought up by your aunties, your uncles, your nannies, all of that kind of thing. It really cements, <clears throat> I suppose, that foundation that I was talking about again and where your journey is. And so those expectations that your whānau have of you um, is always sort of there on your shoulder, um, sort of going that giving back or that service back to your people. So, yeah, the moana space has always been sort of there. I have actually tried to um, move away from it. <laughs> So one of my things when I went to my toes, I was like, I'm not doing any, not doing any fisheries, <laughs> oceans, aquaculture stuff. That's all I did. <laughs> so, um, yeah. And it's interesting with this project as well, sort of, it keeps just coming back that whole connection to Tangaro and Hinamuana. Um, so yeah, it's something I suppose at my point in time in life, you sort of reflect on those things and start to go, actually, there's a reason why you keep coming back to these spaces. So yeah, I suppose that's a little bit of me and 
yeah, who I am and where I come from. Awesome. Yeah, it's amazing to hear about your, you know, your Heidinger and what you've done throughout your life. And interesting to hear those sort of, you know, those core values that you have in terms of growing up on the Marae and then also your connection to the ocean and how it keeps almost calling you back. <laughs> as well, much as maybe you don't want it to call you back, it's calling you back. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And I think it is sort of like I was saying, that point of time in your life where you got, you've got to listen to it. Like there's a reason why it keeps sort of pulling you back into that space. So yeah, um, and I think this project too has helped sort of solidify that, even though again, I've tried to sort of dodge it at that time. <laughs> um, but more so because other mahi comes on the top. So um, yeah, I've been working recently for my one of my iwi um, and a lot of mahi and stuff goes into sort of supporting them and our whanau and stuff like that. So often the project got put on the back burner a little bit as you sort of navigate stuff. So yeah. Um, yeah, it's it's good to sort of be coming to a point where we are starting to wrap this mm. up and where we are is sort of just trying to think about, okay, what's those next steps? Mm. Yeah. And in terms of the project, you know, Tangaroa Ararau, mm -hmm. um, what, what, what is the project, you know, what is the beef, yeah. what is the, you know, what, what are we setting out to achieve? Yeah, well, some of our things, I suppose, it's been quite interesting. I'm just going to get my paper yeah, yeah, make sure yeah. I don't get it wrong. Um, but no, it's been, as I was saying before, just around, um, initially the project was eco-based management and the treaty, looking at it from a policy and legislative perspective um, and looking at, I suppose, how does how do we influence policy to enable tikanga Māori and the promises within Te Tiriti to be given effect to? So the system that we currently have to operate under, whether that's the Fisheries Act, whether that's the Treaty of Waitangi Fisheries Settlement, um, there's a myriad of different types of um, legislation that exists um, to govern and manage fisheries and the oceans. Um, and while some good work has been done to try and embed our way of doing things, it's still missing the mark a little bit. And a lot of that has to do, I suppose, with the fact that that system hasn't been designed by us as Māori or we haven't had a strong voice in the way in which that's developed from its origin. Um, and so this project was around how can we embed tikanga and te tiriti, in particular rangatiratanga, into a system that allows us to better align with a, the way in which we as Māori um, interact or have a relationship with Tangaroa and Henemwana. So yeah, it's 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 a it's it's a project that's focusing at a national policy level. So um it's looking at how do we <clears throat> create policy and therefore legislation that then can enable um our whanau at a local level to make some of these key decisions for themselves. Because as we know Tikanga is different across different Iwi mm. Hapu Fano. Um so that shouldn't be the job of national policy to dictate or define how at a local level that's applied. So it's been looking at how do we do that in a way because ultimately um, that's where the knowledge and um, the dynamics sit is that they need to make those decisions there but how do you create enabling policy to be able to do that. So yeah, that's been some of our, our focus as to how do we um, cut through some of those barriers for the challenges that we see in terms of being able to do, um, to have tikanga up front and te tiriti. And the way in which we've done that is to, we've created a, um, a guiding framework as everyone does. And it's been interesting sort of at the symposium the last couple of days, everyone's got a framework. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like, like, oh God, we've got another framework to add to the other frameworks. But anyway, I think it's, it's a good guide. Um, so we set off as a team, so there's four phases to our project and the first phase was to create a guiding framework initially for the research team. And so like I was saying, um, we're not researchers, so we've got a group of <clears throat> um, practitioners, kaimahi that work in the policy space, so have worked with government, have worked with ministers in the fisheries, aquaculture, ocean space. We've got people that are um, in the courts supporting our whānau to take through, whether it's the Marine and Coastal um, Areas Act um, implementation through. So yeah, we've had a mix of people. Um, and then one of the other key things that we have had is around, um, we've taken a futures thinking approach 
So trying to just sort of set stuff to the side, all those challenges, barriers that we hear often and sort of go, okay, if we were to look at the future um, uninterrupted by the noise that we currently have, what would that look like? And so we've had support come in from um, Chris Jackson from We Create Futures to help us to do some of that mahi. That wasn't a skill set that sort of sat within our research team. So yeah, that's been sort of our journey there in terms of phase one is sort of setting that up um, in terms of our, our framework um, to guide us. The funny thing was, is when we um, developed that up, so we did the good old literature review, <laughs> um, that's what we got told you need to do. It was like, okay, literature review. So we did that, um, did interviews. So the interviews that we, we had were with a range of different Māori experts, I suppose, um, whether it was mātauranga Māori, um, waka haurua, tikanga, um, tāmoko toi Māori as well. So looking at sort of all those different mm. spaces where um, getting whakaaro from different angles. And that's been quite interesting in terms of working with the creators, the creatives, because they think totally different from a policy person like myself who's very much in a box, heaps of words. Um it's, a, it's been cool to work with artists and um, mātauranga experts and stuff because they just think a little bit differently, um, which has been awesome. So, yeah, through that process and through our kōrero uh, with our, with our um, different different experts and stuff, we created this framework. Um, from that framework, we then got it reviewed by others as well, and some of the feedback that we refute, we were received through that process was actually you've got the bones of what a framework should, should be, be for your governance space. Great. Um, which was like, yeah, you don't want to outputs, no. Um, I said I wasn't a researcher. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, it was, the, and it was, I suppose when you're in it, and that's been one of the learnings too, when you're right in it, you actually miss some of the, um, those nuances that actually, okay, I've got my output, I need to achieve that output, so you're just driving to get that output, and then it, it's been really helpful to have external reviewers outside of the research team who have expertise in this area to sort of like make those types of calls. Is so like we've actually got your framework for your governance around. It's like, oh, true. Yes, we do. Um, so, yeah, that's been sort of our process throughout the journey is sort of doing the literature review, doing interviews, developing up the mahi, and then getting it externally reviewed. So, that's been really helpful. Our second phase um, was around the focus area reports. So that one is around diving deep into um, sort of three key areas to help us develop up our governance options. So yeah, our key purpose is to develop a set of governance options and then identify the transitional pathways to move from the status quo to those new options. Um, so stage two was around diving deep and understanding what have those challenges um, barriers been by looking at three key areas. So one was around Māori customary fishing, um, second one was around Māori commercial fishing, and then the third one was around the Takutai Moana Act or the Marine and <coughs> Coastal Areas Act. Um, so the sort of the act that followed the Foreshore and Seabed Act. Um, so yeah, we've, we've sort of dived into those three areas and the way in which we've framed that um, that analysis, I suppose, has been by using future thinking tools. Um, so one of the things that we've focused in on was what they call the futures triangle. So you think about the weight of the past, so what happened previously, um, and what impact has that had? What's the push of the present? So what are some of the drivers that are happening now um, that are impacting on us? What are those challenges, etc.? And then the third part of that is around the pull of the future. So what are those some of those signals that you're seeing from the from the present that could actually lead into what the probable future could be. Um, and it's from that, when you start to sort of pull out that stuff, is around, okay, so what are the key areas we need to focus on to make transformation and in terms of the policy space? So that was one of the tools we used. The second one was around um, what they called causal layered analysis. So again, um, diving deep into the real sort of unconscious issues that yeah. people sometimes don't realise that they have when making decisions or when developing policy. So you hear, 
there's sort of four stages to that. One's the sort of litany of events, they call it. Um, so you hear all the noise, and those are often all the sort of um, headlines that you see in the media around around fisheries, um, around Māori rights and interests, um, and they create a narrative that people sort of hang on to. And then the next layer down is sort of that systemic um, issues that you have is sort of like what's causing that problem and people start to have sort of like based on their own sort of systems or the systems you operate in, you have particular views. And then the worldview that you have, and that's more sort of based on your upbringing or your sort of the narratives that you're very much used to and that you start to establish these own views. And then the last one where they talk about that being the sort of um, the myths, the metaphors um, and that sort of unconscious view that you have that sometimes you don't, your biases, I suppose, um, that are ingrained um, by the way which you've been brought up, etc. And it's sort of trying to look at that is the place where you need to make the changes to be able to incentivize new behaviors and stuff. Because a lot of the, the mahi, I suppose, that we do, especially within the policy space, um, is very political. And it's influenced by society, um, and ministers need to make decisions um, based on, yeah, those that have voted them in. Really, so it's it's sort of a multifaceted approach to sort of looking at what are those key issues. And and again, for some, they're probably that came out of that report in particular. Um, nothing sort of overly, well. And this is the thing, I think, for us that are in the space all the time, you go, oh, yeah, well, we sort of already know that. some of those things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and, it, and it comes back to, well, how do you communicate those things? Because they're still being missed for whatever reason. So, yeah, that's been sort of the phase phase two. Um, some of the key things, I suppose, just that, that have come out of that, and I could probably, I don't know how much information to give or not. <laughs> um <laughs> But some of the stuff that sort of came out of that, of those findings was around, I suppose, the journey of Māori fishing in New Zealand and um, the perseverance and resilience and adaptation that's that's happened sort of from pretty much when this treaty was signed all the way through to to, to today. Um, Māori have had continuously had to battle for their rights to be recognised in some way or form. And even though we have had our, we had the treaty fishery settlement, um, that era has been quite interesting in itself as well. And I think it's always one of the, the things you sort of start to hear is that it's always an evolving process. I think there's definitely been great strides or great um, shifts made in terms of rangatiratanga, in terms of acknowledging tikanga. Um, but there's still a lot of mahi to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So those were been, um, that's been one of them. And then I suppose the key thing too around tikanga itself was that um, it does represent a unique approach to governance and societal organisations. So we've got our Western way of doing things, which is very much like it's got the laws and these are the rules that you have to follow, et cetera. And then you've got tikanga, which is more values, principled based, um, more adaptable and flexible. And so that's the thing when you try and bring those two knowledge systems together there's always going to be tension and I think some of that is around in terms of solutions looking moving forward is how do you find that balance around having some flexibility and adaptability but also having some sort of baseline rules and boundaries otherwise things can sort of go all over the place so that's been one of them I think um, in terms of the customary fishing so again that was about the settlement um, recognising that Māori do have rangatiratanga over their fisheries. There are differences in, uh, within Māori dom to say whether that has occurred uh, in terms of the different regimes that currently exist for Māori fishing. Um, it's also interesting to hear that, again, as Māori, rather than relying on the government to, to for your rangatiratanga, you need to have a rangatiratanga mindset. So for a very long time, Māori have always asked for permission. Mm. So like, oh, can we do this? Can we do that? Um, and that's just a, a legacy of sort of the, the challenges and the, the battles that we've faced over over decades. So that's, um, so when we've spoken to 
so I know that are sort of operating under these customary regs, we've got some saying, oh, we just say this is what we want. And we ask MPI or whatever agency it is to sort of say, well, this is what we want to see. Whereas others are like, oh, we can't do that. We have to do it this way because that's what the legislation says or this is what the regulations say. So some of that's building our whanau's confidence in, in having rangatiratanga and acting in that way. So um, for me and sort of what we've seen is that you're not going, as Māori, we're not going to find rangatiratanga in those settlements or in those um and that legislation, you've got to act it. You've got to be that. Um, so yeah, that's just some of our things for our own whānau is sort of like um, for too long we've always had to ask for permission to do stuff, and yeah, we don't we don't need to. Yeah, if we're wanting to look after our rohe moana, um, then do that mm. and, and actively go and do it and and be a part of it and yeah, have expectations of the government in terms of what support you're required not. But also being, um, that's been one of the things too, the resourcing question always comes up. And it is, and it's very hard to be able to resource to look after your your rohe moana when you don't have any putia, you don't have the capacity or the capability within your own whānau to do that. So you do, unfortunately, has to rely on government to provide that. But I think long term, our whānau need to be thinking about, well, how do we Yes, that might be a short-term thing, mm. but long-term, we're going to be doing this ourselves. So, yeah, that's been some of the stuff. It's amazing. It's really cool. Really like, especially having that. I mean, the layers of of sort of you know your bias, your worldviews, mm. unconscious, you know, unconscious bias or whatever that might look mm. like is to someone who doesn't really look into that stuff. It yeah. could be quite jarring to be like, whoa, 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 what do you what do you mean that that's how I think or yeah. that's how I feel? You know, on an unconscious level, but. Yeah. That's where the most change happens. Yeah. And then I really love the fact that we're talking about Rangatira Tanga and a lot of our Māori talk about that a lot. But then some of us don't have that in us at the moment or we're not utilising that yeah. Rangatira Tanga. It's innately with us. Yeah. But for the conditioning of what we've been living under, our families have been living under for generations, yeah. that conditioning is a lot like sort of with it away that maybe that Rangatira Tanga or that yeah. Okay, So... Hopefully, within projects like this, you know, yeah, helps to sort of shift things. And it's one of those things that, again, if we're throughout all of our projects, that's this type of thing that we're encouraging. Um, because again, policy and legislation is but a tool, and mm. it's not the only tool. And I think again, that whole corridor around Rangatiratanga is that we we can't rely on these systems that have, haven't been created by us to give us our Rangatiratanga. So it is it is a mindset and. Um, yeah, I think I do see it. I, I do see there is that change, though. It is coming. Um, I think there's different different levels of confidence to move into those spaces, um, and and it is a generational thing, I think, as well. And um, yeah, and I think it, again, it's just like how do we start to move into those spaces? Do you think with the mahi that's happening in policy and legislation, and you know, researchers and and, and kai mahi? in policy and, and, and the such and the likes is do you think that there will ever be a time where the kawanatanga and, and our laws and I guess treaty principles come together and align and, and, and work together harmoniously? Or do you think that there's gonna have to be a time where Maori like are treaty orientated and the kawanatanga just Yeah. No. Well, well, exactly. And see, that's been the interesting process that we've gone through um, in terms of our research. So we, we held Futures Wānanga with with different um, sort of ones involved in this space. And it was interesting when we looked at those, like those possible futures. So it talked about futures thinking and some of that corridor around, okay, so if we're trying to get there, how would you get there in terms of ultimately a regime a marine governance regime that um, gives effect to tikanga Māori in a meaningful way, and also tetariti as a whole. So, what does that what does that look like, um, and how would you get there? And so, it was interesting when we did that process. Um, so, we looked out and we said, okay, what happens? So, there's these different archetypes, and I'm not the expert in this space, but there's different sort of archetypes that you can have around sort of um, a direct way in which you might get there um, in terms of, or you might have 
like little tinkering that happens and you might get there long term. Or you have a catastrophic event that actually changes things quite quickly. Mm. Um, and so, yeah, there were, there was different kōrero around, okay, so how would we get to a, a point where absolutely tikanga and te tiriti are given effect to? And it was sort of like some of those radical views that are coming through. Yeah, like, yeah, well, yeah. this would have to happen. <laughs> that would happen. <laughs> um, but it was quite good to sort of see uh, across the four archetypes, um, and I'll just sort of look at what those specifically are, but it was around sort of how do you get to those points because um, there's different ways in which you might get there and what's the policy mechanisms to start to change some of those things under the current regime. Now, some of the thinking we have looked at is what would that look like outside of the current regimes, mm -hmm. right? outside of a Westminster um, framework, ultimately. And yeah, there were some radical views on what that looked like. But we looked at things like he pua pua, um, mm -hmm. he māti ke mai in terms of the spheres, um, and what would that those those things look like. And um, yeah, I think... I think long-term, I, I think it will always be a... A ongoing challenge. Mm. Um, that's why some of the stuff in terms of our co-papa too has been looking at how do you communicate this stuff so it's not scary mm. to everyone because ultimately we're about 16% of the population. Um, as Māori, you actually need more than that to be able to change the way in which things are currently done. And so I think um, one of the the cool things within Sustainable Seas is that you've actually seen the shift by some of the other projects around the importance of tikanga, the importance of te tiriti. The challenge is there, though, is that um, it's how do you do it in a in a way that actually is tika. Mm. Um, not use, not, not using. Yeah, not using yeah, yeah. and adapting and making and making that it all work up. for you. Yeah yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think that's the challenge. There's definitely support. So I think um, there is a sort of groundswell of um, looking at how do we do things better um, by looking at tikanga. But I think it's the tikanga space that really trips people up. I think the, te, the tiriti stuff is interesting in itself because, um, yeah, we, we're now sort of moving away from principles in terms of giving effect to the te reo, um interpret what well, the real version of the treaty and what those things really mean rather than trying to water them down or find a compromise mm. um, so I think that will be an ongoing journey but the tikanga stuff will be quite interesting and and one of the things that we sort of talk about was before the arrival of the settlers we had our own way of governing mm. and our own laws we had our own ways of doing which were a lot more flexible and adaptable but as we as we well, when we were settled, a whole new sort of governance regime came into play, and yeah, that's a lot of time to start to unpick. Sort of going back to all the way back to sort of pre-settler times, and then unpicking all of the stuff that's happened over the last few decades, um, to then go, okay, well, how long is it going to take for us to sort of get to a place where we're, um, yeah, I, I don't. This is my own personal theory. I don't think we'll get there where it's, um, I think we'll get some of the way there. Mm. If I think about between the early 90s in particular and all the settlements that were happening to where we are today, you can look back and go, actually, what's happened? Mm. But at the same time, there's been a lot of big steps. So I think it'll always be like that, where you make some good big strides, but you also take about three or four steps yeah, backwards. Yeah, yeah. yeah. it's going to be a constant sort of yeah. I don't want to say power struggle, but just finding the balance between, you know, te ao Māori and te rohanga Māori, yeah. te kanga, kawa, yeah. and legislation, policy, yeah. rules, and laws, systems. Yeah. Yes, yeah. systems. Yeah. But it's a, it, you know, it's a good fight to have. It's yeah. it's good discussion. Yeah. You know, it's good wānanga. Wānanga. Yeah. Up, to try and at least move towards those and try and make those shifts, those, those pivotal shifts that need to occur mm -hmm. to move us along. Um, so yeah, it'll be, um, so that's sort of lo what we're looking at. And then the, the third phase of our project is looking at those governance models and what they're looking, um, to be, and, and they're going to be based on our, <clears throat> our sort of six, our plan one. So that was our framework that we developed. And so 
the key sort of things that we're hoping to, in mm. terms of looking at um, a governance models, and again, they're all very, it's dependent on the political environment of the time as to how quickly or not things will move uh, in terms of some of these these models. But ultimately, it's looking at how do we, um, how do we create models that allow us to, yeah, sort of align with this Ngampai Moana framework that we've we've developed. Um, so it, it talks about tātai hono, so in terms of our interconnectedness, our whakapapa, um, tau to to in terms of um, duty of care and reciprocity, um, embracing that and acknowledging, I suppose, that inherent obligation that we have. And some of our kōrero has always been around how do you put tangaroa and hinamoana at the heart of decision making. Um, because if that's the focus for everyone, whether you're a commercial fisher, customer, whoever, interacting with the ocean, if that's your first thought rather than protecting your own property rights or stuff like that, we'll have a different conversation. Um, the other one is Ngāhui, so acknowledging the ocean's sort of central role in driving our collective well-being um, and economic prosperity. Um, encompassing community welfare, economic success, and um, environmental equilibriums. So it's that whole thing around, I know there's the sort of like, oh, it's not all about making money. Um, but the the thing we have to remember is that we've always utilised the moana um, in a way to help feed us. Um, but there are big shifts that need to happen there um, by Māori and non-Māori around sort of how we um, have a relationship uh, with the oceans in terms of economic prosperity, what mm. does that look like? How do we ensure that we do follow our own tikanga? Um, and that's quite a challenge, especially for the sort of Māori commercial sector, because they're operating again within systems that incentivise behaviours that might not align with our tikanga. Um, and that's often no fault of theirs, it's just the fact that you have to operate in those systems, whether it's because of tra tax compliance or a whole range of things that um, yeah, make it challenging to for our our Māori commercial fishers to align with their with our tikanga and stuff. So um, the other thing is around sort of mana, so for, facilitating self determination, um, decentralising decision making. So sort of touched on that before. Um, valuing te, so valuing and respecting um, traditional knowledge, mātauranga, tikanga. And the last one being around toy put also recognizing and empowering our local communities. So as I sort of spoke about before, is around how do you enable our local communities to have the the power to make decisions or authority at their level, recognizing that the way in which as a community as a whole, they might make decisions, um, because there's so many different dynamics at play. So yeah, that's sort of what we're hoping in terms of the, the governance models themselves is um, being able to be underpinned by these, looking at those future um, scenarios and how do we sort of work towards those. Um, and then, yeah, the last the last sort of part of our, um, our research is around those transitional pathways. So what sort of legal um, or policy levers can be pulled now to help us achieve or get to those um, preferred options or governance models. So, yeah, that's sort of our our project. There's a lot of mahi and a lot of, you know, whakaaro going into, yeah. you know, the likes of this research project. So just massive ups to you, yeah. the team, for, you know, putting in those hard yards and, yeah, sitting in with the people and talking to our, you know, the Māori and, you know, Mātauranga experts and just, yeah. you know, bringing that all together. But I think with those, I forget the ingoa for them, pai... Ngā pai moana. Their, ngā pai moana, their, their underpinning of, like, those values and, and those sort of, like, concepts yeah. are really, really, like, a, a, a good way to lead this. Yeah. A lead this policy and lead this sort of movement yeah. and change, you know. I definitely resonate with all of them. Yeah. So it's really cool. Yeah. yeah, it's really cool to see, and yeah, I'm really excited to, you know, obviously for you guys to get to the end, but yeah. see what the future looks like. Like, yeah, you know, for the for the ecosystem and yeah. and for our moana. So yeah, now over here, na kia Oh, kapoi. Yeah, just because it's been it's been a um because one of the things too is there has always been a, a key component of our our research is around the dissemination. 
So one of our reports is like over a hundred pages long. And it's like, well, Alvin ain't going to read that. Yeah. No one's going to read that. <laughs> um, so it's been trying to look at, well, how do we ensure that? Um, because ultimately policy is around moving the hearts and minds of people, incentivizing behaviors, incentivizing um, ways of doing things. Um, and so one of our things has always been around um, how do we disseminate this information in a te ao Māori way. So we have looked at, um, so we talked about sort of pūrāko, the way in which it was disseminated previously, pūrāko, waiata, haka, um, whakatauki, all of those kinds of things. So one of our... Um, one of the things we're wanting to do, so we're looking at holding an art exhibition at sort of um, mid, mid June to look at a way in which to disseminate our information. So we're currently working with a, um, uh, some artists. So we've shared our, some of our findings so far and, and they're at the moment developing sort of toy Māori um, from their perspective. And so we're looking at sort of our Ngā Pai Moana um, as one of those, so we sort of shared that with them. We shared sort of the challenges and stuff like that. So really wanting to look at how do we, yeah, move the hearts and minds of all, all New Zealanders. Um, and so we thought an exhibition um, would be a great way in which to share our share our stuff, but more so from a creative perspective, mm. because that type of stuff resonates more with people when you sort of visually see stuff. Um, and that. So yeah, looking forward to that in terms of... Um, being able to work through our project, but but hold that event to be able to do that. We're also looking at waiata and taonga pūro and all of that kind of thing, whakaero tāmoko, potentially, um, in terms of that 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 kaupapa. And it's really to, one, suppose, celebrate the end of the research, but also, <laughs> more importantly, to share our findings, but also we will look to hold workshops mm. during that time, so our... We're sort of looking at our first day would be a focus on more the policy and ledge type um, of kōrero, um, but then the second day being more for the creatives to sort of share their stories around um, Tangaro and Hinemoana and our connections and our history that sits behind it and also our aspirations for the future. Um, so yeah, looking forward to that um, for a number of reasons, but um, but more so around how do we yeah share this with, mm. with others because it is around incentivizing and encouraging new ways of thinking yeah cool that you're thinking about that from in terms of a research project yeah. as opposed to done the research yeah here's the if you want it read this hundred mate yeah, yeah 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 so that's yeah. you know well even when i read it too i'm like oh god that's a lot and it's been yeah it's been quite cool to be able to have like the support of some of those creatives that that operate in that space and as i was mentioning earlier they just come from a different angle and um it was funny when i had we had a wānanga with the artists and stuff, and I did it as I do, my sort of paper with my few pages of documents. It's supposed to be a one-pager, but I think it was a, like a five-pager. <laughs> and um, I had to apologise to the artists because it was pretty much, sorry, guys, I'm a policy person, so there's a lot of work. <laughs> so I'm like, it's fine. And so, yeah, I sort of took them through it and stuff, but you could all already see like this, just this different facade or different angles of thinking, different lens in which they were they were thinking about um, how they might portray some of these things. And I think that's the important stuff, whether it's through pūrāko, whether it's through waiata, um, toi Māori, harakeke, like rāranga and all of those kinds of things. It was it was really awesome to hear and be surrounded by just a different way of thinking. Um, so, yeah, no, definitely excited for that to be able to to share, to share the mahi, but... Um, a lot of time to yeah yeah to come together and to celebrate um and to look at how do we yeah and even like today like the the symposium it's it's time to inspire <laughs> inspire people and stuff to look at okay well gosh I'm, I need to think about these things so yeah just trying to get people involved and really thinking about their place mm. um and how they might contribute or how they might disagree with stuff but that's all good yeah. Awesome. Um, yeah. I mean, that was that was a great a great court at all, and I guess quite enough for tea. But um, yeah, just want to say thank you very much for joining us, Beth. Today it's been you know been wonderful to hear about the project, and um, looking forward to seeing you know it wrapped up and you guys celebrating and having a mean kaupapa. Um, but yeah, na e mihi ana kia koe. Thank you. <laughs>